Good morning, each and everyone. Good morning, uh, one bag members. It's a blessing again to find ourselves in this platform as a way of worship. It's a blessing to see uh, a lot of people are, are joining. Thank you so much to each and everyone. I would like to welcome each and everyone in a special way. Feel welcome. As we are going to start the program of today, which is the second Sabbath of our second month of 2021. As we begin, uh, we're going to start with him number 214. pray as we are going to pray i want each and everyone to pray with me in their hearts show god uh, exactly what is your needs and what you are asking for uh, let us pray thank you lord once again for this beautiful sabbath which you have given to us we are not better or perfect than those one who have found themselves in a different challenge, Lord. But it's because of your message upon us, that's why we can call again upon your name, Lord. With your blood which you share on Calvary, Lord, forgive our sin so that our prayer can reach to you. We present the situation of the world into your hand, Lord. We have nothing to fear because even though we doesn't know the future, but we are very comfortable because we know exactly who is holding the future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you once again. The situation might be worse or it can make each and everyone to be worried. But Lord, we know that you know the end of all this. And we are so thankful for the gift of life which you're still giving to us. As we are going to start the program of today, Lord, we ask for your intervention. We have sick people who are in the hospital, other at their homes, Lord, you have been healing people when you were in this earth and you never stopped because you said you are the same today, tomorrow, and forever. That's why, Lord, we invite your intervention through medication, food, and everything which they use, Lord, we call upon your intervention. Come and intervene to all those who are sick. 
until when they feel better, they're going to glorify your name forever. Lord, there are those one who are traveling according uh, about to your, to your words. There are those one who are traveling because of their own missions. Please, Lord, guide them until when they fulfill their missions. Lord, we put each and every one, one big members, friends and family into your hands. Continue to bless each and every family, Lord. Continue to guide each and every one. Let them fear no more because you are our Lord. We're going to put the divine service into your hands, Lord. The speaker of today, Brother Justin, we put him into your hands, Lord. You know what you have prepared and command him to speak to your people. Guide him. Let him speak according to your will, Lord. Bless each and every one on this platform. And bless those one who, did, who couldn't manage because of different reasons. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The man you're seeing in the middle of the flood is Marcelo, a 43-year-old man trying to make his way back home during a severe torrential downpour in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. After crossing the street, he gets trapped with his bike in swirling waters. As horrified onlookers saw his situation, they desperately screamed at him to let the bike go, but he clung to it. A group of people even risked their lives by forming a human chain to try to save Marcelo, but they could not hold him back. He tries to stand, but the strong current knocks him over and drags him away. Firefighters found his body washed up later the same day. Marcelo lost far more than the bicycle he was trying to keep. What is the bicycle in your life? What is it that the Lord is asking you to let go? but you are still clinging to? A relationship? A job? An addiction? What is preventing you from surrendering your ways to Jesus? What keeps you from being fully devoted and loyal to him? Ellen G. White says that Jesus does not require of man any real sacrifice, for whatever we are asked to surrender is only that which we are better off without. Ellen G. White. Councils on Stewardship, page 300. As you return your tithe and give your promise, ask Jesus to help you embrace what really matters and let go of anything that could jeopardize your salvation. May we put our desires last and God first. Thank you each and everyone. Uh, this time, it was a good time where uh, we're supposed to give our tithe and offering. The banking details are on the screen. I just want to remind each and everyone, please use your name as your reference so that it can be easy for our treasurer to, to identify uh, your tithe and offering. Thank you so much. If you haven't write uh, the banking details, they are on the screen. Thank you so much once again, one big members. At this time, I'm going to welcome uh, the preacher. Thank you, Alda. Justin, um, good morning, everybody, and blessed Sabbath to each and every one of you. Uh, it's a privilege to 
be here this morning and be able to share a, a message with you um, um, on the Sabbath day. Uh, I don't know how your week has been. Um, some of us might have had difficult weeks. Some of us might have had good weeks. And some of us might have had an, um, an okay week. But, but through all the experiences that we might have had this week, I, I know that God has a blessing in store for you today. You know, we're living in, in uncertain times, but there's one certainty that we can cling to, and that is God. As Albert Justin mentioned um, in his prayer, that God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He is the I am, and I, I believe that we can cling to him you no know, matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. Um, in Genesis chapter 1, we, we find something very significant when we, we read the first couple of verses in the Bible um, before we get into the message this morning. In Genesis chapter 1, um, the Bible says um, in verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Bible paints a, a very clear picture in the, in, in, uh, before the world was created, that there was emptiness and the world was without direction or form. But the Bible says in the, in the midst of this chaotic scene, the, the verse continues and says, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And this tells and gives courage to me that in the midst of this crisis of a pandemic that this world is facing, that we can each individually experience Christ that there is Christ in the crisis, and that as we cling to him through this pandemic, that we are experiencing, no matter how we might be separated from one another at this present moment in time, physically, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and that God moves in, in times like this, and it's in times of discouragement that we can actually experience his presence much more. Uh, I read a quote um, a few days ago. It says that for stars to shine, darkness needs to take place and uh, today as we, we we get into the message I, I pray that no matter what experience we are going through that we will experience the presence of god and that god through um, our experience will will shine in us and through us um the sermon title this morning i'm going to try and share my screen very quickly so that you can all see The sermon title that I uh, have this morning is entitled To Be Wise. And it's taken from the passage of scripture uh, in Daniel chapter 12, which will be our focus passage um, this morning. Um, if you have your, your, your Bibles with you, um, if you don't, um, there will be some of the scriptures on screen, but I would encourage you to, to go along with me through the message, through um, um, using your, your Bible this morning, using your swords. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says the following. And they that be wise, that's the title of the sermon, be wise, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The title of the message is, and they is that be wise, be wise. Let us pray before we get into the message. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we thank you for the privilege that we have to, to come and open up your word. Father, we know that any man can open up this book and, and memorize text. But we know that your word reminds us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we pray, Lord, that as we, we go through the message this, this morning, that you would not just author our faith, our faith, but that you would make it firm and complete in you today. I pray, Lord, that as I lead out in the message this morning through this platform, that not I but Christ be lifted up, that not I but Christ be honored, loved, and exalted. 
exalted and that not I but Christ be seen, be known and be heard. Father, may your spirit lead and move from each um, pl uh, place and those that have heard this message and will be hearing this message on a different platform that they, that each and every one of us will experience you like never before. May your spirit lead us and may we follow you. But we ask this in Jesus' name and for your sake we pray. Amen. Here in the book of Daniel chapter 12, we find the, the end of a prophecy that has been given to Daniel in, in an earlier chapter, in chapter 11. And the Bible tells us here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, at the conclusion of the, the vision of the prophecy, it says, Daniel, he says, and they that be wise, the angel says, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. At the conclusion of this prophecy, we are told that the purpose of the prophecy are to turn many to righteousness and to shine as the brightness of the sun. But according to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, we, say, we see that it's only a, a group that is able to do this. The Bible classifies them as the wise it says and they that be wise but the bible also tells us that this experience of of turning many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever and to shine brightness according to daniel chapter 12 verse 3 takes place at the time of the end according to daniel chapter 12 verse 4. the bible says but thou o daniel shut up the words and the seal the book even to the time of the end and it's in this time after the time of the end according to the book of daniel it was sealed will be opened and they that be wise shall turn people to god shall turn people to righteousness the question is as we, we read this text is who are those that are called to be wise for us to understand this we need to understand according to the prophecy when the time of the end is because it's according to this prophecy according to this time as daniel is given the prophecy and the vision he says unto the time of the end then many shall turn to many to righteousness the wise shall turn many to righteousness so for us to understand who is called to be wise we need to understand when the time of the end is and so the question is what then does the bible tell us when the time of the end is? And the answer is yes. In Daniel chapter 11, verse um, 33 to 35, the Bible says, and they that understand, in other words, they that are wise among the people, shall instruct many. And this is speaking about God's people. They that be wise, they that, that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall, according to the Bible, the Bible says, by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be harpen with a, a little harp. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding, the wise, shall fall, the Bible says. And to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for an appointed time. The Bible tells us that those that understand God's people, they shall fall by the sword, the flame of captivity, in other words. They will, they will go through a, a time of, of, of captivity, of what we understand, um, persecution, in other words. This time, the Bible says, that God's people will go through the time of persecution. And when they go through persecution, they will, this persecution will come to an end. And at this time, the Bible says, this time is the time of the end in Daniel. That's what the Bible is referring to in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 35 says, And some of them of understanding shall fall, to tie them to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet an appointed time. And so the question is, beloved, the Bible says 
that they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firm, and this shall happen at the time of the end. According to Daniel chapter 11, they say that the wise will go through a time of persecution. And it's after the end of the persecution, we will then see the time of the end. Now, the question is, does the Bible tell us when this time is? The answer is yes. And for us to understand this, we need to understand who is doing this persecution so that we can understand when this persecution ends. And when we understand this, we understand the, the, who God has called to be the wise and to turn many to righteousness. The Bible, does the Bible reveal to us who is doing the persecution? The answer is, yes, it does. In Daniel 11 verse 36, the Bible says, and the king shall do according to his will. And so the question is, who is doing the persecution? In Daniel chapter 11, the Bible says, the king. And he shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. And so what we find here in Daniel chapter 11 is that Daniel tells us that the time of the end is a time after the persecution. And who is doing the persecution? The Bible says a king, but not any king. It is a king, the Bible says, that exalts himself and magnifies himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of God. Now the question is, beloved, is there a king that meets this characteristics, that calls himself above God and is God and speaks great things against God? Because if we understand who this king is, we will understand when the time of persecution is. Now, in the book of Daniel, is there a king that, that meets this characteristic? Yes, there is. It is none other than the little horn power found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. He refers to the little horn power. And a horn, according to the Bible, refers to king or king. And how do we know this? In Daniel 7 verse 24, the Bible says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. And he, the little horn power, according to Daniel chapter 7, the king, shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Now, understanding this, let's read verse 25 of Daniel chapter 7 verse again. It says, And he, the little horn power, the king, shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints, persecute the saints of the Most High, and to think to change times and laws, and they shall be given to his hand until a time and time and the dividing of time. And so the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 7, he, the king that speaks great words against the Most High, the king that exalts himself above God, is none other than the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. And according to Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, the Bible tells us that this king is a persecuting power. And his persecution is given at an appointed time. According to Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, it goes on to a time, a time, and dividing of time. Now to make this prophecy short, beloved, this given period of time, this times, times, and dividing of times, speaks to the 2060 year prophecy. And this time is given to us in, according to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. And this time started in 538 AD and ended in 1798 AD, according to Bible prophecy. And it's after this time, 1798, the time of the end, that what is sealed in the book of Daniel is opened. Now, it's very interesting, beloved, that in the beginning, in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel tells us that if God gives him the prophecy, he says, shut up the book until the time of the end. Seal the book. 
Now, does this mean, beloved, that during the time of persecution, during the time of 538 AD and 1798 AD, that no one could open the book of Daniel and read it? Does this mean that people could not open the book of Daniel and read in the book of Daniel the story of the lion's den and understand it? No. So the question is then, so what was then sealed? And why was it sealed? And who are those that are called to be wise to be able to open up this book and understand until at the time of the beginning of the end? Who are this? Does the Bible reveal what was here? In Daniel chapter 8, the Bible reveals to us about a vision that was here. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, and the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So the question is, what was sealed? The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 26, ch chapter 8, verse 26, the vision of the evening and the morning was sealed. But what was this vision all about? What was the vision of the evening and the morning? In Daniel 8, verse 14, the Bible says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be came. That the word days in the original language means evening and morning. And so it was the prophecy of the 2,300 days given to, Daniel given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 that was sealed. But why? What does this mean? Let us recap very quickly. In Daniel chapter 12, Jesus, God gives Daniel the vision. And he says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so what we find through the book of Daniel is that God had given a vision to Daniel Highlighting the fact as we, under, as we unravel through the scriptures of Daniel that through the time of persecution, from 538 to 1798, through the time of persecution of the little horn power in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, a vision will be sealed. That vision is the vision of Daniel chapter 8, the vision of the evening and the morning, the 2300 year prophecy. And it's after the time. After 1798, that the Bible says that what will be sealed after the time of the end, 1798, what will be sealed will be open. The Bible classifies this as that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And so the question is, beloved, is it because after 1798, that there was more technology that now people could understand the vision that was sealed? No, 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 no. What does the Bible mean when the Bible says that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased? What will take place? After 1798, what happened? The book of Amos refers to those that run to and fro as those that are seeking the word of God. The Bible says in, Dan, in Amos chapter 8 verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So it is in 17, after 1798 that God moves upon the hearts of men to seek the word of God, particularly the prophecy of Daniel 8 verse 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the saints be king. And then what happened? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 that those that understand, those that are wise, the Bible says the following. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. 
Many shall be purified and made white and cried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the what? But the wise shall understand. And as the God's people is seeking his word, as God's people is studying Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 unto 2,300 days, God then gives them the understanding, the understanding of the vision of Daniel 8 verse 14 unto 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be clean. But why does God do this? Why does God give a vision to Daniel and then takes away the interpretation thereof and the understanding? Why does he do them? Is there an account in the Bible where we can rely on, where in a similar sense, God had given a message or a vision to someone? And then after he gives this message and vision to someone, he takes away the interpretation and the message so that no one can understand until a time when some person or some people that God has chosen to give the message and the interpretation they are. Is there an instance in the Bible that, that, that reveals to us such a case? The answer is yes. In Daniel chapter 2. Remember the story in Daniel chapter 2? King Nebuchadnezzar is given a dream. And the dream is, is taken away from King Nebuchadnezzar. And in this time when the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar is taken away, King Nebuchadnezzar calls all the wise men of Babylon to give him the message and the interpretation they are. But none of them could give them the message and the interpretation. But amongst the people of Babylon, Amongst the people of Babylon were God's people, the Israelites, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, one of the wise people of God. And it's through Daniel that God gives Daniel the interpretation and the vision and the message of the king. And it's through Daniel giving the king the message message and the vision of the king that as a result God is magnified and people are turned to him and in like manner after 1798 God calls a people so that God can be magnified and that many can come to a knowledge of God and turn to him but why the prophecy of the 2300 days. We know that this prophecy points to the year 1844. People expected Christ to come, but he did not. But it's out of this group of people that God raises up a movement called the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a true understanding of Daniel 8 verse 14 of Christ's ministry in the sanctuary. That Christ was not coming back to earth, coming, uh, the world wasn't coming to an end in 1844, but that Christ's ministry was moved from holy to most holy place. And it's in this case that Christ started his work of investigative judgment. And understanding that this work of investigative judgment, understanding that the work of Christ's ministry was the preparation work before the coming of Christ. Jesus even said it himself in, Daniel, in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. He believeth in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That way I am, you may be also. Jesus makes it very clear that he's gone to prepare a place. And once the place is prepared, he will come again. You see, for us to be ready for the coming of Christ, we need to understand his ministry in the sanctuary so that we can know and align ourselves with Christ 
and point people to Christ and his ministry so that when Jesus comes again, we can be ready for the coming of Christ. So that Christ can be, God can be magnified and that many can be turned to righteousness through the ministry of Jesus. And why is this so significant? Why is it so significant in this time for us to understand that Jesus is in the most holy place? That we need to understand that the work of Christ in the most holy place is so important to you and I. Why is it so important? It's because many in this world believe, beloved, that the ministry of Jesus, that the work of salvation, that the ministry of Christ ended at the cross of Christ. That because of Jesus dying on the cross, now we are saved. But beloved, the ministry of Jesus did not end at the cross. But the cross of Christ was only the key that unlocked the work of salvation. And because this is the case, we are either moving in this journey in this world with Christ in his ministry or we are moving away from him. And if we do not truly understand the ministry of Jesus in the sanctuary above, as we presently are living in, we can find ourselves in a disadvantage and a mispreparation for the coming of Jesus. And so the question is, what is Jesus doing in the most holy place? Does the Bible give us a description of the most holy place in the sanctuary? Now in Hebrews chapter 9, Paul gives us a description of what is found in the most holy place. And when we go there, we should ask the question, why is this important to you and I today? The Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3 and 5, and after the second veil the tab of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, the most holy place, which had the golden center and the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The Bible tells us that as Paul describes what's in the most holy place, he says that in the most holy place, we find a golden center. So what does this mean? And how does that mean in the ministry? What is it? How does this apply to the ministry of Jesus? And how does this impact your life and mine? As we are living in the time of the end. You see, the golden censer was placed before the mercy seat of God. And what was done in the golden sense is that incense was placed in there and it would then, um, it would then smoke, in, the incense would then flow with the front of the mercy seat of God. Now this incense represents prayer according to the Psalms 141 verse 2. And because of time, we won't go there, but you can jot it down, Psalms 141 verse 2. Prayer. And how does this relate to you and I? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it tells us that there is one man and there's one mediator and one God between man and God, and that is, and that is Jesus Christ. It speaks about Jesus interceding on our behalf. And it's because of Jesus' intercession as we pray, because Jesus stands before God and mankind, that God answers our prayers. And it's understanding this, that God forgives us, not because of who we are and what we've done, but because of Christ. And as Jesus intercedes on our behalf, we have this assurance that we have such a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but we're, all, but, 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 but we're in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And therefore we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Not because of our righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ. 
And it's because of Christ and his intercession on our behalf that we can come to God and experience God today. The other thing that is in the most holy place, the Bible speaks of the ark in the ark of is the ark of the covenant. And these has and this has three articles in it. The Bible says in the ark of the covenant is the table of the covenant. In other words, it is the law of God. And this tells us that the law of God, beloved, understanding that the ministry of Jesus did not end of the cross, that they that be wise shall turn shall turn many to righteousness is to an understanding that the law of God is still binding today and that God still keeps his covenant. And that is why Jesus says in John 14 verse 15 that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the covenant that God will fulfill according to Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 is to write the law of God not on tables of stone but into the hearts of men. And that the law of God is still binding today. And not just part of the law, beloved. All of it. That God is still God. And because God is still God, we can trust in Him. The other thing that is in the Ark of the Covenant is Aaron's rod that budded. And we know the story in Numbers chapter 17, verse 18. The children murmured against Moses and Aaron that everyone could, could minister and be the priest of Israel. And God had given them a test that each one of the tribes would, would bring the, a, a rod and engrave their name on the rod and they would bring it to the tabernacle, something that was dead. And they would place it in the tabernacle and through, as they placed it in the tabernacle, the one that God had chosen he, that rod would be different to the others. We know that Aaron's rod was dead and it budded. How did it bud? Through the power of God. And this speaks to us about the resurrection. It speaks to us that Jesus' ministry didn't end at the cross, that Christ resurrected so that you and I can have an intercessor on our behalf. But more importantly, as Jesus now begins his work of investigative judgment, that those that are laid in Christ, that are dead in Christ, will resurrect at the coming of Christ, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. And so Aaron's rod that budded speaks to the resurrection of Christ. It also speaks to the state of the dead and also speaks to the coming of Jesus. That when Jesus comes, it is God that resurrects the dead. And that those that are alive will meet him in the air at the coming of Jesus. And so in the most holy place, we have this assurance that Jesus is coming again. And before he comes, we need to be ready. We are either living for Christ and with Christ, or we are not. And so Aaron's rod that buds speaks to us about the resurrection of Christ. It speaks to us about the state of the dead and also speaks about the confirmation of the coming of Jesus. The third article that we find in the most holy place is the pot of manna. Now we understand, according to Exodus chapter 16, that the Israelites murmured against God. That they thought that God had led them into the wilderness to hunger and die. But the Bible tells us that God rained manna from heaven. And this manna from heaven was given by God. And this account, according to Exodus chapter 16, speaks to the fact that what God had provided for the Israelites was sufficient. Remember the account? God was going to rain manna on the first day to the sixth day. And on the sixth day, God would give a double portion of manna being rained down from heaven. And what would happen is that the people of Israel, Israel would, would gather the manna on the first day. 
But what was gathered on the manor on the first day, they were to eat on that day because if they had to carry it over to the next day, what would happen? It would breed worms and it would sink. But God tested them because the seventh day was the Sabbath day. And what happened on the sixth day is that God provided a double portion of manna. And God said that if they keep this manna for the next day, they need to prepare because what God had provided for them was sufficient to carry them through the Sabbath. And so it was a test of that what God provided was sufficient for them. It spoke about God being our creator and God being our redeemer. It pointed the Israelites to the Sabbath, that we keep the Sabbath today, not because of the day itself in the sense of that, that God didn't bless the other days. No, that's not, that's not the reason why. But that the Sabbath is a memorial of the fact that what God done for us in creation and what God has done for us in redemption is enough. And that God, the same God that created us, is the same God that will sustain us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And the Sabbath is a sign to you and I. It is a memorial of the fact that the God of the heavens and the earth is real and alive. Beloved, understanding Christ in the most holy place is important in the times that we are living in today. And God has moved upon the hearts of men so that they could understand that what God is doing is for the benefit of men, so that we could be saved. But the part of manna also speaks about something that is significant for you and I today as well. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, the Bible says that the part of manna was speaking about something significant. Not just about the Sabbath alone, but it spoke about where, who sustains us and who directs us. It says in, Daniel, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, And he that humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Of man. And friends, as you are living in the time of the end, we need to live, not by the bread that we eat, but by the word of God. What sustains us is not the physical food, what sustains us is God. And it's through understanding this, through understanding that God sustains us, that God is our provider, that God is our redeemer. And understanding this, this will carry us through the time on the end and will allow us to be wise in such a way that will turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So I want to conclude this morning's message by learn, le leaning on two parables in the New Testament very quickly. It's the parable of the wise man. And in Matthew, we find this parable in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. And we know the story of the parable of the wise man. Um, he built his house upon the rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. But the wise man, the Bible tells us, how did he build his house upon the rock? That the rock was none of but Jesus Christ. But how was Christ the rock, his foundation? He was a man that did not, did not just listen to the word, he was transformed by the word. He was not a hearer of the word, he was a doer of the word. And friends, if we are to be wise in this time, we are not called to be informed Adventists. God has called us to be 
transformed Adventists in such a way that we will hear God's word and do it and go out and magnify God through the message that we have of Christ. Christ in the heavenly sanctuary who ministers on our behalf. Christ our creator. Christ our redeemer. Christ who resurrected for us and Christ that is coming again. Friends, we need to build our house upon the rock which is Jesus the last parable that I want to refer to is the parable of the ten virgins very quickly and in the parable of the ten virgins we understand that the ten virgins according to the spirit of prophecy is to be present truth until the close of time and so the application of the parable of the ten virgins is significant for you and I today the parable of the ten virgins says that the virgin represents those that are pure, those that have the pure faith, the true faith, the understanding of the true knowledge of the ministry of Jesus. The Bible tells us that five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And what made the wise wise and the foolish foolish? The wise, the Bible says, has oil in their vessels. And so from the outside, the, they all had vessels, but the wise had oil in the vessels. And so from the outside, they all looked the same, but they were not. The Bible says the wise had oil in their vessels. Oil in the parable represents the Holy Spirit. And this is important to understand, and you could, therefore we can understand that the the, the reason why the, the wise virgins could not give the foolish any oil. Because the oil is the Holy Spirit. And, he, and the Holy Spirit, beloved, is not a virus that we can give from one person to another. The Holy Spirit is God. And for us to experience the Holy Spirit in our vessels, in our personal experience, we need to have a personal experience with God each day. We need to have a personal experience and the Holy Spirit will mold us in such a way as we surrender our lives to Him daily. And our experience with God, we cannot give to another. And it's through our, our surrendering to God on a daily that allows us to be prepared when Jesus comes. And God is calling us today, beloved, not to be foolish virgins, but to be one. I want to say this very quickly. That the parable of the ten virgins also tells us something that's significant, something very significant. Is that this, and don't get me wrong when I say this. The parable of the ten virgins speaks to us as a church today. It speaks to the Seventh-day Adventist church, a church that God has called to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. It calls about our mission and our purpose. But our mission and our purpose is not to call people into the, into the traditions of Adventism, but to the Christ of Adventism. Did you get that? That making this world Adventist will not make this world a better place. It is making this world, calling this world to Christ, to Christian, to be to a knowledge and an experience of Christ and the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. What we believe as the foundation of the church will allow people to experience the Christ of Adventism. And it's through this experience of Jesus that will bring the coming of Christ and an end to sin and a readiness for Jesus. Beloved, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to be wise. Let us be wise today. Let us shine for Christ, living by His Word, sharing the Word, 
and holding fast to the word until he comes again. Beloved, the ministry of Jesus is significant to you and I and it is significant to the world today. People are living in hopeless times. They are living in a time of crisis. And what this world needs today is Christ. And Christ is waiting with longing desire for you and I today to experience it. God has called us to be wise. Beloved, let us be wise, not just for this moment, but for eternity, as we surrender ourselves to God. Amen. heaven, Lord, we want to say thank you for your word this morning. We want to say thank you, Father God, that you still speak to us and that in the midst of a crisis that we are experiencing, that we can explore or experience Christ. And Lord, that you have called us in, in times like this to be wise and for the reason of knowing you, for the reason of experiencing you. 
but also so that you could be magnified and so that many can turn to knowledge and experience of you so that each one of us can experience salvation and be ready when you come again. I pray, Lord, that it will be everyone's experience of hearing this message and going through this program today that we will surrender our hearts to you and that we would choose to be wise. And as we do so, Lord, that through that experience that you will use us as vessels of light to a world that is in need of light. And that, Father God, that when Jesus comes again, that it will not just be us that will be faithful and ready to meet you as we surrender ourselves to you, but that many will be turned to righteousness and many will come and be ready to meet you when you come again in the cloud. Father, I want to pray for Winebrook Church. I want to thank you, Lord, for their, their work. I want to thank you, Lord, for their willingness to be of use by you and I pray Lord that you would continually bless them and, and use them as a, a light in the community and that they would continue Lord to, to spread the message not just through words but through service to mankind and that through that experience that that, that they would be uh, the light of, of heaven to to their community in Cape Town and that the message of Christ will, that they will give to the world Will, will hasten the coming of Christ and prepare many to meet you. Thank you, Father God, for, for being with us. Thank you, Lord, for, for hearing our prayer. And thank you, Lord, for answering it. And as we, we go through the Sabbath day, as we might be separating from each other on this call, may we not be separated from you, but may we experience the Lord of the Sabbath day today and forevermore until we meet you face to face. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And for your sake, we pray. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The triumphs of His grace my gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. He breaks the power of cancel sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulness clean. His blood avails for me. Hear him, me death, praise him, me dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come. And leap ye lame for joy. Ye blind, behold your Saviour come, and leap ye lame for joy. Oh, for a thousand, oh, for tongues, a to thousand sing, tongues to sing, 